Welcome to another podcast of Tales of Glory. We are on episode 32. And in this episode, we return back to the teachings from the classic of St. Teresa of Avila on the interior prayer life, her book, The Interior Castle. And where we pick up today is back in the Fifth Mansions, chapter 4, the last chapter in the Fifth Mansions, where she continues discussing all the uh, fine details of the prayer of quiet she's been talking about to the Fifth Mansions. Like I said, it's been a while since we've, we've talked about St. Teresa of Avila. To me, she's like a fine wine. I got to wait for the right moment, the right time to talk about her. And as I read her stuff, I'm just let it marinate through my mind and my soul and spirit of what she's saying and then pick up with the episodes. I'm your host, Reverend Michael Norton, and let's dive into today's episode on St. Teresa of Avila and see what the her final statements are before we move on to the higher mansions of chapter six of what's going on with the prayer of quiet. So as usual, if you are new here, I usually provide PowerPoints on YouTube, which are like a simulcast that go with this podcast. So if you're a visual person, I kind of am a visual person. I learn by seeing and hearing. You can go to my uh, YouTube podcast, which is hosted on a field guide to spiritual warfare dot blogspot dot com. Look up St. Teresa of Avila, Fifth Mansions, Chapter 4, Episode 32 of Tales of Glory, and you'll find the stuff you need. I also post my show notes there and information I have that go along with this, that when I provide the research or stuff I thought was interesting on a subject matter, you can go to that uh, blog site and find the information you need. We're also on Spotify, Apple iTunes, and it's also hosted on Anchor FM. So if you're listening to any of those two in the car and you just want to listen to something crazy stuff that's going on here with St. Teresa Avila and what Mike's into currently in researching, that's the place to go. So with no further ado, for my YouTube viewers, let's launch them PowerPoints, Mac. We are in, again, St. Teresa of Avila's classic um, on interior prayer life, the interior castle, Fifth Mansions, Chapter 4. Just a quick recap on the Fifth Mansions, where we're at right now, right? On TV shows, right? I always do it to you guys. Previously, on St. Teresa of Avila's interior castle's Fifth Mansions, we studied, right? Let's go back and look at these. So she's talking about mystical experiences in the Fifth Mansion. We're in the Third Water. The Third Water is from her Book of Life. She's talking about mystical experiences there, too. She broke it up um, in, in, in four stages, but she broke it out even further in her Fifth Mansions. Third Water is where, talking about prayer, where she kind of associates it with something mechanical, comes in, starts helping with a prayer, and starts providing the water, the prayer towards us. And she called that the Third Water, where prayer becomes easier. And it's on the mystical side. And we had two sides. We had ascetical, when we pray to Jesus, and we had the mystical side where Jesus comes to us. I believe the first and second waters were ascetical prayer. She's talking about, you know, at first you're, you're at the at the well, pumping it by hand, trying to get the water up. And then the second one, God will stick in a windmill or something that will help you pull up water a little bit easier. In the fourth mansion, he has some, some mechanical pump coming in that's helping you pump water. That's the third waters. So as we look at this, let's return to Fifth Mansions Chapter 1, she in, introduced the mystical prayer of union, which was the, the union of wills between us and Jesus as we've gone deeper into our prayer life. Chapter 2, she introduced the metaphor of the silkworm and the cocoon. Remember, we like that little worm that's chewing on the silk or whatever it is, right? It, it's um, chewing on the material. That's the ascetical prayer. We're, we're just learning to pray with that little worm. And then we go into a cocoon as our prayer life deepens, right? And then Jesus is that cocoon. And then we emerge that that butterfly or that moth. She called it a butterfly for the metaphor. And we emerge this beautiful little thing that can um, fly. And that's, that is how she pictured our, our mystical life. She was real big on metaphors here. It's kind of cool. So now chapter four, the prayer of union. She, she calls it pre-betrothal to spiritual marriage of the soul to Jesus. And I put on the PowerPoint sides, like we have maps always, right? I always put, you are here. That's where we are in chapter five of the fifth mansions. She's talking about pre-betrothal to spiritual marriage to the, of the soul to Jesus. So let's do a recap on the prayer of union, which is the prayer of union of the wills. In these mansions, God enters the inner sanctum soul so deeply that when it returns to itself, it has no doubt whatsoever that it's shared with God an experience of mutual dwelling. 
And this is a quote I have from Dennis Billy in his book, Interior Castle, the classic text with the spiritual commentary, page 123. And I'll put that in the show notes. That's a really good reference to have when you're reading this. I know the Carmelites have a reference too, but it's, it's not as easy to read. I like um, easy reading English where the words just make sense. I don't need to look up stuff. Um, but I still have the, um, the Carmelite version on my Kindle. But this is a good book to pick up. Interior Castle, the classic text with spiritual commentary by Dennis Billy, if you're looking into this stuff. Very good text. So, the Fifth Mansions, Chapter 4, addresses the question of, what exactly is the prayer of quiet? I know she's been trying to address it through the first three chapters we looked at um, earlier. So, St. Teresa uses the intimate relationship metaphor of betrothal to explain this mystical prayer. She says the prayer of quiet isn't betrothal, which happens in the six mansions, but this is pre-betrothal. So when we're talking about these, these relationships here, St. Teresa is using an old metaphor of marriage and betrothal that was from the Middle Ages. So we have, I think she said there was four stages. The first one is the, the two people meet, the two souls meet, and decide whether they want to pursue this relationship. And pre-betrothal, the relationship's looking good. Yeah, we probably want to pursue betrothal at this stage, you know, and promise ourselves to one another, but it's developing. The relationship's still developing. And in stage three, there's betrothal. We're getting married. We, we want to be with each other. We're the soulmates. And in stage four is the marriage. So what she calls spiritual marriage to Jesus, or it's the tr- completion of the transforming union, which Paul calls it. So there's, there's four stages there she's building upon, and that's how she's explaining these mystical experiences and why they happen and what they look like through what she described. She tried to break them up in stages. You can't really break them up in stages, but it makes sense how she did this. So just follow along. And the fifth mansions, at the culmination or the peak of the fifth mansions, as we develop our relationship with Jesus, we're in a pre-betrothal stage. The soul likes Jesus. He loves him. It's like, wow, you know what? We can make this happen. We can make this work. And we could probably start going deeper to a stage of betrothal, which is in the six mansions. So we're in the fifth mansions. We're in pre-betrothal. We have this relationship going on with Jesus. It's, it's, it's very intimate. It's very deep. We know each other. We know each other's thoughts. And our wills are kind of combining it. We're, we're surrendering to his will because it's a love relationship, right? That's how we surrender our will to him. It's a very loving relationship. It's not like surrender, you know, you know, submit and be conquered. That's not what he's talking about here. It's like, it's like surrender your will. Like, wow, I just want to do anything I can w- with this amazing Jesus right now that I just, yeah, I just, I submit my will. I want to be with him. That's, that's what it is. It's very free and deep. It's a deep relationship development going on. Let's look at the commentary for St. Teresa put in place. So for chapter four, she says, further explanation of the same subject, explains this prayer, the importance of being on one's guard as the devil eagerly desires to turn souls back from the right path. There there are more warnings. She always warns us about this. As we go into mystical prayer, there are lots of spiritual warfare. Chapter four, paragraph one, she titled it The Spiritual Espousals. I think you'll be anxious now to learn what this little dove is doing and where it is going to settle. For, of course, it cannot resist in spiritual consolations or in earthly pleasures. It is destined to fly higher than this, and I cannot fully satisfy your anxiety until we come to the last mansion. God grant I may remember it then, and find an opportunity to write about it. For almost five months have passed since I began this book, and, as my head is not in a fit state for me to read it through again, it must all be very confused, and I may possibly say a few things twice over, as it is for my sisters, however, that matters little. I want to explain to you, still further, what I think this prayer of union is, and I will make a comparison as well as my wit will allow. (laughs) There she goes again, that's funny. Afterwards, we will say more about this little butterfly, which never rests, though it is always fruitful in doing good to itself and to other souls. But because it has not yet found true repose, you will often have heard that God betrothes himself to souls spiritually. Blessed be his mercy, which is pleased to so humble itself. I am only making a rough comparison, but I can find no other which will better explain what I am trying to say than the sacrament of matrimony. 
The two things work differently, for in this matter, which we are treating there, is nothing that is not spiritual. Corporal union is quite another thing, and the spiritual joys and consolations given by the Lord are a thousand leagues removed from those experienced in marriage. It is all a union of love with love, and its operations are entirely pure and so delicate and gentle that there is no way of describing them, but the Lord can make the soul very deeply conscious of them. So that was paragraph one. Let's look at this. So Teresa returns to her metaphor of the butterfly emerging from the cocoon, right? That was from chapter three. She introduces a concept of spiritual marriage or what Teresa calls a sacrament of spiritual marriage. So she's calling this thing a sacrament, right? It's blessed. Something's coming in. It's holy with it. Teresa then explains spiritual betrothal, where the mystical state of our relationship with our indwelling Jesus is a union of love. That is spiritual betrothal. We're voluntarily in a union. Let's move on to paragraph two. She titled it, The Prayer of Union Represents a Betrothal. It seems to me that this union has not yet reached the point of spiritual betrothal, but is rather like what happens in our earthly life when two people are about to be betrothed. There is a discussion as to whether or not they are suited to each other and are both in love. And then they meet again so that they may learn to appreciate each other better. So it is here. The contract is already drawn up and the soul has already been given to understand the happiness of her lot and is determined to do all the will of her spouse in every way in which she sees that she can give him pleasure. His Majesty, who will know quite well if this is the case, is pleased with the soul, so he grants her this mercy, desiring that she shall go to know him better, and that, as we may say, they shall meet together and he shall unite with her himself. We can compare this kind of union to a short meeting of that nature because it is over in the very shortest time. All giving and taking have now come to an end and in a secret way the soul sees who the spouse is that she is to take. By means of the senses and faculties, she cannot understand in a thousand years what she understands in this way in the briefest space of time. But the spouse, being who he is, leaves her and after that, one visit, worthier to join hands, as people say with him, and the soul becomes so fired with love that for her part, she does her uttermost to not thwart this divine betrothal. If she is neglectful, however, and sets her affection on anything other than himself, she loses everything, and that is a loss every bit as great as the favors he has been granting her, which are far greater than it is possible to convey. So where are we here? So looking at this paragraph two, the prayer of quiet is not a spiritual betrothal, but a pre-betrothal, okay? Pre-betrothal, the soul in love surrendered its will to her future spouse, the indwelling Jesus Christ. So Teresa is referring to a meeting or a courting where after meeting, the two people desire to pursue a deepening relationship. This is the pre-betrothal. The, the meeting's taking place in the fifth mansions. You know, you're, she says there's a spark, there's a fire. It's like that. Uh, perhaps like a, a love at first sight, right? The, the, the heart's just on fire, like, wow, I want to be with this person. This person's so amazing, and she just can't get it out of her mind. It's, it's almost like a love sickness going on here. And she's like, yeah, I, I want this man. I want him in my life here. And that man is Jesus Christ. Fifth Mansions, chapter four, paragraph three. Before the spiritual nuptials, temptations are dangerous. That's what she calls this paragraph. So, Christian souls, whom the Lord has brought to this point on your journey, I beseech you, for his sake, not to be negligent, but to withdraw from all occasions of sin. For even in this state, the soul is not strong enough to be able to run into them safely, as it is after the betrothal has been made, that is to say, in the mansion which she shall describe after this one. She's referring to the six mansions. For this communication has been no more than, as we might say, one single short meeting, and the devil will take great pains about combating it and will try to hinder the betrothal. Afterwards, when he sees a soul is completely surrendered to the spouse, he dare not do this, for he's afraid of such a soul as that, and he knows by experience that if he attempts anything of the kind, he will come out very much the loser, and the soul will achieve a corresponding gain. So let's take a look at paragraph three. 
So in this paragraph, St. Teresa warns us to be vigilant about occasions of sin when explaining the state of prayer. Remember, occasions of sin go way back to the second mansions, right? With the, the, the new souls, they've already crossed over the first mansions, the second mansions are just learning to pray, they're getting rid of sin, and she warns us about occasional sin. So this is something that takes place farther back, and the enemy is still using the same old weapon. You know, throw, throw addiction back in their face, throw drinking back in their face, throw porn back in their face. So she says to be aware because the enemy is going to use the same old garbage he's been using all along against you, and those are the occasions of sin. So when the soul enters in his pre-betrothal, Teresa tells us to expect some warfare. If you're in this mystical state of prayer where you're going deeper, you're going to be expecting a lot of warfare. And she mentioned that back in the, the fourth mansions as well, right? During trials, expect trials where, you know, they'll be so intense that, you know, they may even involve demonic stuff with it. But God knows you're going to make it through the trial because you're in a deeper relationship with him and you're going to come out stronger. He's developing a trust factor. So the devil wants to interfere with the soul surrendering to the indwelling Jesus. And that's what he's going to do at every cost right now. You're going to face some warfare as you go deeper. The enemy's going to go, I don't like this. I'm going to break up that marriage or I'm going to break up that, that relationship before it even happens. Here we go. He'll jump in there. Okay, let's move on to paragraph four. The great good done by souls faithful to these graces. That's what she's titled this, this particular paragraph. I tell you, daughters, I have known people of a very high degree of spirituality who have reached this state and whom, notwithstanding, the devil with great subtlety and craft has won back to himself. For this purpose, he will marshal all the power of hell for as I have often said, if he wins a single soul in this way, he will win a whole multitude. The devil has much experience in this matter. If we consider what a large number of people God can draw to himself through the agency of a single soul, the thought of the thousands converted by the martyrs gives us great cause for praising God. Think of a maiden like St. Ursula and of the souls whom the devil must have lost through St. Dominic and St. Francis and other founders of orders, and is losing now through Father Ignatius, who founded the company. All of them, of course, as we read, received such favors from God. What did they do but endeavor that this divine betrothal should not be frustrated through their fault? Oh, my daughters, how ready this Lord still is to grant us favors, just as he was then. In some ways, it is even more necessary that we should wish to receive them, for there are fewer than there used to be who think of the Lord's honor. We are so very fond of ourselves and so very careful not to lose any of our rights. Oh, what a great mistake we make. May the Lord of his mercy give us light, lest we fall into such darkness. All right, she's giving us the marching orders there, right? You know, pick yourselves up by your bootstraps. Let's go do these girls. <laughs> she's commissioning her nuns. Okay, let's look at the notes here we have on, on Para 4. We are given... A warning of intense warfare. That's another message. It's just it's constant through this. If you're going deeper with Jesus, man, the enemy's gonna come in and mess with you. Souls can reach a state of prayer and still be won back by the devil through pride and sin. Very important. And she's gonna expand upon us how this looks um, further down here. She also warns us to be fruitful while we endure profound suffering trials, most likely from fallible human mentors regarding painful relationships we will encounter suffering in this mystery of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Let me actually come back to this because I'm thinking I'm unpacking the whole notes here and it's before I get ahead of myself. To survive this harsh trial, choose humility and rest there. Teresa is addressing mature souls who undergo more intense warfare. She warns of us the human fallibility of leaders, mentors, and founders of new religious orders and communities. God raised up leaders, does something great in the eyes of the Lord, but they fell to sin from the enemy. The soul suffers from the leader's sin or betrayal and develops a heart wound. Jesus didn't want this soul to be wounded or suffered. What is going on here? What she's talking about is, and I've seen this a lot as a counselor, I've seen this a lot working with pastors and um, pastors have been hurt or, um, you know, people operating in the mystical um, areas have been hurt by mentors. What happens is God will put a mentor in your life to help raise you and pull you along and develop you. But after a while, you maybe find that as amazing this person is, they're deep in their, their love for Jesus and stuff. They're a highly flawed human. And in the end, they don't have the capacity for a relationship and they end up harming you or hurting you in some way that's deep and cut. Um, I've had a senior pastor do this to me. I've had um, people I worked with in supernatural ministry do this to me. 
and what happens is these leaders are carrying a high weight on their shoulders as they mentor and the enemy will come in and make them fall in the harshest way possible such that it also causes a heart wound to the people they're 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 mentoring or working with i probably have um four spiritual men in my life that did this actually five and one spiritual woman did this it happens and they're and they're not so much a deep heart wound anymore um a couple of them were but as you get to understand what's going on here you just understand okay they're humanly fallible that was a good person jesus worked with them and i i gleaned a lot of good stuff off that person to grow me spiritually so because a lot of times the mind goes to a place well why should i accept it? anything from this person if they betrayed me so badly. Well, God wanted you with that person to glean that, what was good from them and to help promote you and raise you up, even though he knew they were flawed. And what we don't do is judge them because they're in a trial they failed, if that makes sense, right? They're in a, they're in a higher level. They may have failed their trials miserably, but God didn't give up on them. So we don't judge them. We don't you know point fingers at them and stuff like that. It's just God's still working through them. But there was a point where there was damaging where God had to separate us and protect what we had in us and developed in us to move on. That's what he's talking about here. So the soul suffers from leaders or betrayal and develops a heart wound. Jesus didn't want this soul to be wounded or suffered. And in doing so, I mentioned up earlier about the mystery of Jesus. When this heart wound occurs, it's a suffering. And the reason we go through this suffering because it brings us into the mystery of Jesus of how he suffered, if this makes sense. It's something very deep going on. And so as we go with this union of wills, we understand suffering as Jesus understood suffering. If this makes sense. It's kind of um, interesting that we go through this, but it pulls you in deeper to him if you survive the trial and you bring in deeper trust with him. It's how he builds trust. He didn't want these people to fail, but the enemy comes in during trials and puts something in their faces that causes them to fail. And sometimes they fail big. And you're wondering, how on earth did you fall for that? But it just has to remind you too that we're capable of falling too. And we have to be very careful as St. Teresa is pointing out here that we could fall horribly and don't don't succumb to it. You know, and, and possibly the enemy's gonna come in too. Well, we're, we have our heart wound we're healing from. I had one offense I'm still healing from. It's over 10 years old and it's, it's getting lighter and lighter, you know, and I, I work with pastors who've had that too. And I understand what it is. So I'm help, help them walk it out. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go read, read um, was it John Bevere's The, the Bait of Satan? Offense. He gets us through offense um, on our side, the mentee side, right? <laughs> if you want to call it, we're the mentee, the mint mentees. Um, we'll get the offense, and that's how Satan tries to um, get us through. That's part of the damage, right? Part of the wound. We develop the soul wound to the heart wound. And Teresa says, just be very careful of this and walk it out, and don't be judgmental of these people. Just pray for these people to survive their trial and come out on top because it, it's very public to them. And it's horrible, and we don't want it ourselves. It's you know, it's kind of how some churches handle it. You know, it's 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 hard. But if you're going through this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like I said, I've had it about, happen about five times in my spiritual growth since 2007. So it's, it's, it's interesting. So that's where she's at with this. And it, it's a, the suffering has helped me. Because how has it helped me? Because it, it helped me on my counseling side where I understood the wounds. And I have a lot of um, young prophetic people who had mentors that just went off the deep end with them and hurt them, and they didn't want to be prophetic anymore, yet they had a gift, so is there a rescuing gift too? So guys, I just don't completely work with ritual abuse survivors. I also work with bringing wounded um, ministers back into play for Jesus Christ. And that's that's where I've seen this a lot, and I felt it a lot too. You have to go through this to grow, to go deeper with Jesus. It's just there. It's so amazing how St. Teresa is able to bring up this roadmap of our interior life and show these are, this is where you're at. This is what you're going through develop that healthy relationship with Jesus and his healing. Let him heal your heart. He's going to do it. And just pray for the other person. And I mean, like I said, if one of mine was a huge offense and the bait of Satan book by John Bevere is a good book to read through on that one to help you walk out of that. It's amazing. Also go look at, um, if you're stuck in this too right now, before I move on, I talk about forgiveness in a field guide to advanced spiritual warfare and one of the tales of glory podcast back there. Look at the one of forgiveness. It talks about forgiveness and how you walk that out. It's it's not a magical wave of the wand. I forgive you. It's a, it's a walk out. So if you're, you're stuck there and you want more information on that because you're, you're in the fifth mansions and this happened to you, go ahead and listen to that. So let's move on. So again, souls are entering betrothal. Come to the spiritual trial because Jesus is inviting them to a deeper union with him. We will have a soul wound filled with hurt and betrayal. This trial is to make the soul more fruitful by going through this profound suffering 
The lesson is to learn humility, patience, and trust the Lord over the prideful ways of man. It brings a deeper peace in this union. The outcome is peace. You have peace in the soul once it's through. That's what it is. You have developed trust to follow Jesus and you have peace. Move along to paragraph five, titled Religious Subject to the Devil's Deceptions. There are two things about which you may ask me or be in doubt. The first is, if the soul is so completely at one with the will of God, as has been said, how can it be deceived since it never desires to follow its own will? The second, by what avenues can a devil enter and lead you into such peril that your soul may be lost when you are so completely withdrawn from the world and so often approach the sacraments? For you are enjoying the companionship, as we might say, of angels, since, by the goodness of the Lord, you have none of you and any other desires than to serve and please him in everything. It would not be surprising, you might add, if this should happen to those who are immersed in the cares of the world. I agree that you are justified in asking this. God has been abundantly merciful to us. But when I read, as I've said, that Judas enjoyed the companionship of the apostles, had continual intercourse with God himself, and could listen to his own words, I realize that even this does not guarantee our safety. Look at paragraph five here, what's going on? So she brings up question one. How can the soul be led into deception if it's following the will of God? Question two, how can the devil perilously deceive your soul if you're detached from the world and taking sacraments? Teresa points out that even Judas was in the audience of Jesus Christ himself and the devil got him. Got that one? Therefore, the presence of God doesn't guarantee our soul's safety. We must be vigilant to the schemes of the devil, constantly, constantly vigilant. They said Jesus, Jesus and Judas, Judas, you know, Jesus loved Judas and Judas betrayed him. And there it is right there. Can you imagine how hurt Jesus felt, right? There was a betrayal there. Moving on to paragraph six, Satan's stratagems. To the first question, my reply would be that if the soul invariably followed the will of God, it is clear that it would not be lost. But the devil comes with his art for wiles and under color of doing good, sets about undermining it in trivial ways and involving it in practices which, so he gives it to understand, are not wrong. The devil's going to repaint this thing as looking good or you're working for Jesus. Be careful of that. Little by little, he darkens its understanding and weakens its will and causes its self-love to increase until, in one way another, he begins to withdraw from the love of God and to persuade it to indulge its own wishes. Wow. It's a very slight change of the rudder. He does it slowly to deceive you. The deceptions are small. So let's look at what she was saying here in paragraph 6. Answer to question 1. If we are following the will of God, the devil can ensnare with small deceptions that appear good, and little by little, the devil undermines us and weakens our ways, will, and darkens understanding, causing the soul to withdraw its love for God. How is that even possible? But he does it. He's a little stinker, right? He was snares. Paragraph 7. Why are they permitted? And this is also an answer to the second question. For there is no enclosure so strictly guarded that he cannot enter it, and no desert so solitary that he cannot visit it. And I would make one further remark, namely that the reason the Lord permits this may possibly be so that he may observe the behavior of the soul, which he wishes to set up as a light to others. For if it is going to be a failure, it is better that it should be so at the outset than when it can do so many souls harm. So what she's saying here, answer to question two, never presume you're safeguarded from the access of the devil. And the Lord may allow this so the soul can be light to others. Like, wow, did you see what happened to this person or something, you know? It's, it's kind of like the people I work with when they fell, one of the things in my heart was I never want to treat other people like that. And that was the light that came out of it. Not only did I glean the lessons they need for me to learn, become a deeper spiritual person, but in their darkness, I was shown firsthand how they started treating others, how the, the devil started slightly, you know, adjusting them little by little, and they became not very good to people. And so that kind of burned into me with the heart ones. I'm not going to treat somebody like that. I, I couldn't possibly do that. And it's kind of set with me. It was like, you know, it's, if I see that, it kind of triggers me like, well, how can they treat somebody like that? That's not cool. 
that's one of the things that will gleat with you to be a light to others. Or it may be um, how they fell will be a light. Wow, did you see how that person, how they fall for that? And it's in the back of your mind, you're going, I'm, I can't believe that person fell for that. And it's how dangerous, you know, this is. And the devil can suck you into stuff. So I'm going to be conscious and not complacent of what the devil's capable of doing to me. Right? That's, that's, that's why it's a light to others. Moving on to paragraph eight. Prayer and watchfulness are safeguards. What should we be most diligent about, I think, is this. First, we must continually ask God in our prayers to keep us in his hand and bear constantly in mind that if he leaves us, we shall at once be down in the depths, as indeed we shall. So we must never have any confidence in ourselves that would simply be folly. But most of all, we must walk with special care and attention and watch what progress we make in the virtues and discover, if any way, we're either improving or going back, especially in love for each other and in our desire to be thought least of and in ordinary things. For if we look to this and beg the Lord to give us light, we shall at once discern whether we have gained or lost. So looking at paragraph eight, beg God in prayer to keep us in his hands so we don't fall or get deceived. We must beg constantly. Beg the Lord to give us light as to whether we are moving forward or backwards in our relationship with him. We can't be stagnant at this point. It's a relationship that's just constantly moving and he wants to show us more stuff. So we must and always be conscious of our soul to be going deeper with him. We sing, pray, we spending quiet time in prayer. Are we spending practicing his presence? Are we spending having mental prayer and conversations with him whenever possible? It's not just 15 minutes in the morning, like during the day. Are we talking and reaching out to him? It's a relationship, right? We reach out and text or call our loved ones or our, 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 our spouses, you know, and it's the same thing. I'm going to reach out and text in my mind on a mental prayer with him. Hey, how's it going? Send him a funny meme or what do you got or something. I got a funny meme of the devil. Check this out. It's funny. You make him laugh. Uh, paragraph nine, God's watchfulness over our such souls. Do not suppose then that when God brings a soul to such a point, he lets it go so quickly out of his hand that the devil can recapture it without much labor. His majesty is so anxious for it not to be lost that he gives it a thousand interior warnings of many kinds, and thus it cannot fail to perceive the danger. So what's she talking about here? Jesus will not simply allow the devil to snatch up our soul in his conquest. The devil is going to have to work hard to get the soul through trials. God will warn us a thousand times over in mental prayer or through convictions of the Holy Spirit. Don't look at that porn. Don't have those thoughts. Those are convictions of the Holy Spirit. Look, it's, it's warfare. It's a trial. Don't listen to those demonic thoughts coming in. Do not listen to them. Those are convictions of the Spirit. But the person may ignore it. You know, the mentors I worked with ignored those, those warnings. Horrible things happened. There's infidelity, all sorts of stuff that happened. It was horrible. Paragraph 10, progress and virtue. Let the conclusion of the whole matter be this. We must strive all the time to advance. If we're not advancing, we must cherish us Serious misgivings, as the devil is undoubtedly anxious to exercise his wiles upon us. For it is unthinkable that a soul which has arrived so far should cease to grow. Love is never idle, so failure to advance would be a very bad sign. A soul which has once set out to be the bride of God himself, and has already had converse with his majesty, and reached the point which has been described, must not lie down and go to sleep again. So I'm packing 10, paragraph 10. We must never be relaxed in our strive to move forward. The devil will see our being lax as an opportunity. When your soul reaches a state of prayer, it should be working to advance deeper and not be idle. So in this courtship, if the soul is in pre-betrothal with bridegroom, speaking to him, it should not fall asleep. Right? Don't be lax. Don't, okay, you know, I've got this far. I can just take a break here. That's not what she's saying. That's when the, that's when the devil moves in. The wiles of the devil shows up. Paragraph 11, a significance of our actions compared with the reward. And so you may see, daughters, how our Lord treats those whom he makes his brides. Let us begin to discuss the six mansions. And you will see how slight is all the service we can render him and all the suffering we can undergo for him and all the preparation we can make for such favors. It may have been our Lord's ordinance that I was commanded to write this so that we shall forget our trivial earthly pleasures when we fix our eyes on the reward and see how balanced is the mercy which makes him pleased to communicate and reveal himself in this way to us worms. <laughs> I like her things. She always throws in humility. So fired by love of him, we shall run our race with our eyes fixed upon his greatness. 
See that right there? So fired by love of him. She, it's like the love sickness. She's on fire. There's a spark. She's on fire. That's, that's her, her analogy here. We shall run our race with our eyes fixed upon his greatness. So regarding paragraph 11, we must never be relaxed in our strive to move forward. The devil will see our being lax in opportunity. So when the soul reaches a state of prayer, it should be working to advance deeper and not be idle. Paragraph 12. St. Teresa's motives for writing on prayer. May he be pleased to enable me to explain something of these difficult things, which I know will be impossible unless his majesty and the Holy Spirit guide my pen. Were it not to be from your prophet, I should beseech him to prevent me from explaining any of it. For his majesty knows that, so far as I myself can judge, my sole desire is that his name should be praised and that we should make every effort to serve a Lord who gives us such a reward here below and thus conveys us uh, some idea of what he will give us in heaven without the delays and trials and perils incident to this sea of tempts. For, were it not that we might lose him and offend him, it would be a comfort if our life did not end until the end of the world, so we could work for so great a God and Lord and spouse. May it please his majesty that we be worthy to do him some service, unmarred by the many faults that we always commit, even in doing our good works." Amen. And so she wraps up. Fifth Mansions, chapter four, right? So that's incredible stuff there. We must constantly be working and striving towards this, this pre-betrothal state of prayer that we're in and not to be lax in it. And we're moving towards the six mansions, which, like we said, we don't check boxes off here. We just happen to enter here and we figure out we are here by what she's talking about. It's not like, okay, I'm in the fifth mansions now and I'm gonna go to a, a class on Wednesday nights in my, my church. I'm teaching six mansions. And once I finish that course and then my member course, I'm in six mansions, yay. It doesn't work like that. The relationship works as you go deeper with God. You could be in the fifth mansions for five years, 10 years, three months, who knows? And it's not something like, oh my gosh, I've been stuck here for 10 years. It's like, it's, so what? you're still in a relationship with Jesus and he's going to take it the pace you need it. You know, like she said earlier, some, some of her nuns she worked with, they, they plowed through this stuff in about six months to like, they're like seventh mansions. Like, she's like, what? Um, but still, it's just, it's at your pace with him. It doesn't matter. It's the journey. So don't worry about it. Like I, I am stuck in the fourth mansion. So I'm thrown back in the third mansion. She said that too, right? She had, she was in a mystical state of prayer. And all of a sudden she found herself looking up one day, I'm back in the third mansions. What happened? Because God's putting her through more trials to clean her up. You know, humility was a key word here. What else we got here? You know, we couldn't get through St. Teresa of Avila without having spiritual exercises. So we're going to do one on Teresa and recollection. I know we do this one all the time because I know we have new listeners. So it depends on where you're at here. Recollections where we practice the presence of God and we're picking up the phone. We're dialing God. God, I want your presence. I want your presence to be here. And that's the, the ascetical recollection. There's mystical recollection where God picks up the phone and shows up, go, hey, I'm here. And you're like, whoa, I totally feel your presence. That's cool. You just all of a sudden showed up. Um, some people may be there. It's just, you know, he picks up the phone when he wants to. He's not going to pick it up during the show or he might by accident like just teach you guys something. Who knows? But it's all in his grace when a mystical recollection happens. Therefore, we are going to pick up the phone and dial and call him. Recollection is practicing the presence of Jesus Christ. For those of you who follow along with this and been listening in on St. Teresa of Avila, I like starting with Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I'm God. So again, what you're going to do here is find a place to relax. If you're driving, you know, just listen. Don't, don't participate. If you're um, at home, you know, just find your easy chair where you can just kick back, relax, wherever it is you go to connect with God. And close your eyes and say, be still. And know that I'm God and just let that echo and shut down everything that's going on in the day. I don't have to worry about, you know, the cupcakes that I make for my kids' birthday party. You know, I don't have to worry about the uh, the Excel spreadsheet I have to finish by lunch right now. It's just whatever's going on, you're going to pur purge it out of your mind and just quiet the mind. If this isn't Zen Buddhism. We're not, we're not um, reaching zero Zen. We're just shutting all the faculties off, right? We're turning light switches off on things just to, so it's gentle and quiet. We don't have to be processing stuff in the imagination. We don't have to be processing stuff in the reasoning. 
Just let the imagination go quiet too. Be still and know that I am God. And Jesus, I just ask right now, we just reach out and we, we pray for people here who are listening that maybe this is their first time reaching out to you. We just ask the connection be made. And we also ask that people who have dissociative identity disorder, that their parts be still. This is okay. This is, tr this is the true Jesus coming in, the real one, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who loves you so much, the one who says, let the children come. It's that Jesus. He's coming in. He just wants to be with your parts and be still. And if you can, just imagine Jesus there. Maybe you quiet yourself, just focus on a picture of Jesus. Maybe focus on a picture of you sitting with Jesus right before him. Just the two of you, just an intimate setting. You're looking in his face. You're sitting there. Just imagine his face there and how, how pleased he is to be with you right now. Just you and you alone. It's this stage of pre-betrothal. You guys are looking at each other like, wow, this is going to be a great eternity together. This is going to be awesome. We're going to make this happen. And he wants nothing more than to be with you. Nothing more. He's look at his eyes too. How excited is he about that? Just to be with you. Now, as we stay in that place right now, I'm going to read some of Teresa's words on recollection. She says, "Give me the grace to recollect myself in the little heaven of my soul, where you've been established your dwelling. There, you let me find you. There, I feel that you are closer to me than anywhere else. And there, you prepare my understanding." that all things of the world are but toys, seems all of a sudden to rise above everything created and escape it. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, it's come closer. I feel that you're closer to me than anywhere else and that you prepare my understanding that all things of the world are but toys. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, let me feel your presence. Let me see you and feel your presence. I'm just going to rest there with you. I'm just going to rest there with you, Jesus. This is a very intimate setting. Jesus is so pleased to see you. Look at his face. Look at his eyes. My God, if I could only recall often that you are dwelling within my soul, I think that it would be impossible for me to give myself up to the things of the world. For compared with what I have within me, they seem to have no value at all. You are dwelling within me, Jesus. And there's times I think it would be impossible to give up all things of the world, but compared with you, what I have within me, they seem to have no value at the moment. Only you, Jesus. Only you have value. Thank you, Jesus. Just feel his presence there. Maybe he wants to say something to you. Maybe this moment Jesus wants to say something to you. Just listen to him. Look at his face and listen to him. Maybe there's something he wants to heal. Let's give it to him. Let him have it. He wants to help you as your wills join there. Your wills just join. You just want to be with him. Your will just wants to stay in this moment with him. Help me, O Lord, to withdraw my senses from exterior things. Make them docile to the commands of my will, so that when I want to converse with you, they will retire at once, like bees, shutting themselves up in the hive in order to make honey. Withdraw my senses, Lord, only you. Oh, it's only you. Let my will just go to you. Let my will just retire like bees shutting themselves up in your hive. Let my will just go to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. That you're so important. That in your eyes I could see how my importance I am to you. I can see it through your eyes, Jesus, right now in this moment. I can see it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. We know in the pre betrothal time, it's just it's short. So, Jesus, if we're starting to lose picture of you or something now, we thank you for coming. We thank you for showing up. And Jesus, we absolutely love you. And it's so amazing how much you love us and what you went through for us. And please protect us as we go on this journey from the wilds of the enemy from being deceived 
And if we have heart wounds from mentors, please bring us understanding of what we were to take away with that. What were we to take away from those people during the time we were with them? And help us walk this out. We ask these things in your precious name, Jesus, the God Almighty, the Creator. There is nothing higher, nothing higher. You are the one who was in the beginning. You were the Word in the beginning. The one who created the spiritual realms, the unseen realms, and our physical realms. And all the spiritual beings and us spiritual beings embodied in flesh. You created everything, the creatures. You and you alone. You had preeminence. And we acknowledge that. And we love you. We thank you, Jesus. As we just come back in now from our landing, in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So we'll just pause here a minute. I know some of you guys coming in for landing. Some of you guys had some pretty intimate stuff going on there. If it was just a simple one, it's okay. Remember, the goal of this is just where you're at right now. Some people can't even visualize Jesus. That's okay. These are what the exercises are for. It's kind of like um, we're going to the spiritual gym and teaching you guys how do you interact with Jesus. That's what we're doing. So don't be frustrated if things don't work. And like I said, don't be frustrated if other people are ahead of you in church because we don't know where they're at. They may be feeding you a bunch of fooey. So at this time, just it's where you're at and being real with Jesus, how you go deeper. So it looks like next time we're starting the Six Mansions, Chapter 1. We're getting some good stuff now. This is where the, all the super crazy stuff happens. Amazing mystical stuff. I'm excited to get here. Um, I should probably move forward, but I, I think Six Mansions has like 10 chapters. Maybe we'll do like two chapters at once. Let's do something really meaty. I don't know. We'll see how it flows. If I had to go to 10 chapters, um, 10 separate shows, that's fine too. We'll do it. Because the information is too good here. I mean, this is where this we finally got to the the big thick steak, right? If you like steak eater, we got the big thick juicy steak that was cooked properly, and this is chapter six. I can't wait for this one. So until then, all right, guys. So like I said, this is uh, episode thirty-two of Tales of Glory. I post show notes there too, and I'll probably post information on um, the prayer we did and where the link was because that was, came out of a, I think it was a Saint Teresa of Avila's book um, autobiography life. She talked about this. And it was a good meditative tool. So until then, like I said, um, I'm still working with um, ritual abuse survivors in my area. And like I said, they're, they're financially crushed sometimes. So if we're just taking donations on that side to help them or taking donations to help keep us online the podcast, to keep us going, just to get information out. Because I know there's some um, survivors we have out there too who listen to us. And we try to help them out in that way with the show. So yeah. Um, and also, it's not just about um, survivors, it's about other people, too. My, my goal right now is to help people who are um, dealing with prophetic ministry and going through hardships right now, because I counsel on that. And it's just, that's where we're at, and I help pastors also. So when I go through these, um, St. Teresa of Avila, I'm also going through this with pastors and people I, I work with in counseling. It's some very meaty stuff. Good, cool conversations every time. They're very unique. So this stuff is very important to every pastor and lay minister all up. To the Pope, right? I don't care who he is. Hey, the Pope's listening. Hi, Pope. How you doing? Glad you tuned in. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's where we're at. And it, go ahead and like us on YouTube. Like us on, and subscribe to us there. Uh, like us on um, anchor.fm. Like us on Spotify, where we can, just so we can get the, to get the word out. We're, we're a small ministry. We don't care to have uh, 150,000 followers. It's no big deal here. I just want to keep doing what I'm doing, and I want to keep helping the people I'm helping, even though it's a small community. And that's where I'm at. So no, you know, there's no plan to grow. There's no plan to <laughs> have some national ministry going on here. But kind of sort of it is in a weird way. It hops around. It's kind of, and we're still helping people um, in foreign nations right now with underground churches who who um, need information. But they they, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? We're 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 aware of world events right now that are going on, and so we're helping um, underground churches too as well in ministry. So love you guys. God bless. Until then, have a good one.